So apparently there is a Netflix curse. I've covered so much spooky stuff on this page and I've seen nothing like this ever. So Netflix recently released a new docuseries called Breakpoint and it showcases 10 of the hottest up and comers in tennis right now. But right now is also the Australian Open. And zero of the 10 tennis players featured in the docuseries made it to even the second week of the Open. These are 10 of the best tennis players in the entire world and two of them lost to players seated at 87 and 113. And three of them didn't even make it to the Open because of leg injuries. And people are accusing Netflix so bad of cursing these players that Netflix even came out and said that it was just a coincidence. But if it's a coincidence that happened to every single player featured, that's pretty insane. These are scary games to play in real life, part three. This game is called Cat Scratch and you need at least two people to play. To start the game, one of you needs to sit down on the floor and the other one lies on the floor on their back with their head in your lap. And if anybody else is playing, just have them sit around you guys in a circle. Next, rub the person's temple who is lying down in a soothing motion as you tell them a scary story about a cat. This is how it goes. You are walking down a dark alley late at night. You are the only one there. The ground is slick with rain. The alley is filled with garbage cans and litter. But then you hear something, a movement in the garbage cans. You pick up your pace. You want to get out of the alley fast, but then you see something. Red eyes, glowing red cat eyes. They are the eyes of an enormous cat. You run, but the cat chases you and jumps on you. It scratches you one, two, three. Cat scratch, cat scratch, cat scratch. After you finish the story, the person gets up quickly and pulls up the back of their shirt. And you would then notice you have red claw marks on your back. And the crazy thing is you won't feel anything. I deliberately crashed the plane I was flying after a breakup, killing all 149 people on board. My name is Andreas Lubitz, and I was 27 years old at the time of the incident. I had been a co-pilot for one year, and I was suffering from depression. I had already been treated in the past, but I had decided to stop taking my medication. It was on Tuesday, March 25th, that I decided to act. Around 9.30 p.m., the captain left the cockpit to go to the toilet. I then pressed the lock button, which locked the doors making it impossible to enter from the outside. No one else could get in. A few seconds later, the captain came out of the bathroom and started banging on the door for me to open it. I didn't answer him, and I had already started to dive the plane. A few seconds later, the plane exploded against the mountains in the Alps in France, killing all passengers on board without exception. A few months earlier, I had told my ex-girlfriend that people would remember me, but she had no idea that I would be capable of doing something so terrible. Since this horrific event, aviation has changed its rules, and it is now forbidden to be alone in the cockpit. I committed two murders at the age of 16 during my fugitive days, and that propelled me to become a globally recognized rapper. I am the rapper Tay K, born as Taymor Trayvon McIntyre. And here's my story. Involved in dark affairs, I was placed under house arrest at the age of 16, but on March 26, 2017, I decided to cut my bracelet and escape, marking the beginning of my fugitive journey. Passionate about rap since childhood, I took advantage of my time on the run to record tracks and later create a music video. But lacking a camera, on April 23, 2017, I robbed and killed Mark Saldivar, a young photographer, to steal his camera. A few weeks later, I robbed and assaulted a 65-year-old man, taking his wallet and leaving him for dead. Then comes June 30th, 2017, where I released the track The Race and got arrested the same evening. The media seized the story, and the track went viral, eventually becoming platinum. I even received tremendous support from fans through the Free Tay K movement when I was incarcerated. The music video for The Race now has over 240 million views on YouTube, and I currently have over 4 million monthly listeners on Spotify. But this success, I contemplate for my cell because I was sentenced to 55 years during my trial in July 2019. We were the perfect couple on TikTok, but my husband ended up shooting me in the head. My name is Anna Abulaban. I was 28 years old in 2021 when my husband killed me with a gunshot to the head, leaving our young daughter without a mother and with a father in prison. My husband, Ali Abulaban, was already a violent man before my death. He constantly stalked me and was excessively jealous without reason. He always thought I was cheating on him, despite being a loyal woman and mother. No one knew the truth behind the image of the perfect couple that we pretended to be for everyone, both in real life and on social media. 
Our relationship began to deteriorate, especially in 2021, when I could no longer bear to be with him because I feared for my life and that of my daughter. On October 18th, 2021, I asked Ali to leave our home. I was afraid of his reaction, so I obtained a restraining order against him. Three days later, he entered my home and installed an app on our daughter's iPad to listen and watch what was happening inside my house. On the same day, Ali heard the voice of one of our close friends in my house and simply couldn't bear it. He entered my home again, but this time I was present, and so was my friend. He killed my friend Rayburn Barron with three shots to the head. Right after that, it was my turn. He killed me the same way. Today, he faces charges for a double murder. Beware of what people show on social media. So whatever happened to Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment at the Oxford Apartments? If you don't remember, this is where Jeffrey Dahmer was eventually caught, and this is where they found all of the gruesome discoveries associated with Jeffrey Dahmer. It's absolutely eerie to look at photos of his apartment and consider what they found in there. But what happened to the building, the Oxford Apartments building? Well, obviously, after investigators discovered what they did in Jeffrey's apartment, the place was stained forever. And so shortly after all this happened, the apartments, the entire complex, they were demolished. And nowadays, all that's left is this patch of grass where the apartments once stood. It's got to be eerie living in one of these units and knowing exactly what happened right here. I actually went and filmed a whole Jeffrey Dahmer documentary where we visited the old Oxford Apartments area and investigated for paranormal activity. Let me tell you, that place is loaded with energy. At one point, using our devices, we captured what looked like bodies laying on the ground, like three or four of them. And I think at one point, using one of our devices, we literally heard the voice of Jeffrey Dahmer coming through. I'm not kidding. I know that sounds really extreme, but you have to listen to the video and, and just see what I'm talking about. Anyways, it's called The Ghost of Jeffrey Dahmer if you want to look it up and learn more about the Jeffrey Dahmer story. And my wife and I actually did a whole Dahmer series on our podcast, Murder in America, if you want to listen to what I'm talking about. A woman obsessed with true crime murdered a stranger out of curiosity. Jung Joo Jung is a 23-year-old woman from South Korea. In June 2023, she was arrested after something horrific came to light. Jung had posed as a mother on a tutoring app to lure a victim to her. She pretended to be a mother who was looking for an English tutor for her daughter. She contacted a total of 54 people before eventually picking a victim. The woman in question has not been publicly identified but is known to have been 26. She arrived at her home disguised as a young student. It's thought that her victim believed that she was a child due to her looking quite young and also her arriving in a school uniform. After being let in, she stabbed the young woman to death before leaving for the supermarket. There she bought cleaning supplies and bin bags and headed back. After returning to the house, she dismembered the young woman. She then got into a taxi carrying the woman's body parts and put them in a wooded area. The taxi driver sensed that there was something odd going on and reported this to police who later found the body parts. They arrested Jung and she has since been convicted of murder. Investigators also found her internet search history included how to kill and ways to get rid of a body four months prior to the incident. The police stated that Jung had concocted the plan to catch the victim unawares and kill her out of curiosity. She had apparently had an unhealthy obsession with true crime books and shows. She has since been sentenced to life in prison. These are videos humans were never meant to see. Okay, so we all know how North Korea lies and makes stuff up to their citizens literally 100% of the time. And anything they say to them, the citizens will believe it and have to believe it. Well, the video I'm about to show you shows a North Korean tour guide giving a tour, explaining how North Korea beat the United States of America in a war. This is absolutely crazy, and just listen to this. Korea, the even brought aircraft care enterprise. They make us surrender by force of arms. At the time, they said, they would start another Korean war if we didn't return the ship and the previous sailors. But following the instruction of the great leader Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, we responded that we would answer their retaliation with retaliation and answer their all-out war with an all-out war. We didn't surrender, but we took tough stance. So in the long run, they had no choice but the proposed dialogue. So 11 months after the capture, the U.S. government sent a letter of apology that was December 1968. And that apology was the first one that they ever sent to the other government in the history of America. So following that, all sailors were sent back to the country. A 
83, uh, 82, exactly. One was sent back dead, and the rest of them were sent back alive. But we didn't send the ship because that is a war trophy. Okay? <laughs> this teenager made friends with a lonely stranger, and he then killed her in the most horrific way. Karen Dewa was a 16-year-old girl from Fife. She was a talented dancer who was described as a likeable and kind girl. She was a family girl who spent a lot of time with her elderly nan. It was 2005 and 18-year-old Colin Evans from Wales had just moved over across the road. As I said, Karen was a really kind girl and she wanted to make him feel welcome in the area. She befriended Colin, not having a clue what he was capable of. Now, Colin was no stranger to the police and he was accused of at least 14 disturbing S offences. This had been going on since he was 10 years old. One woman even reported him to police 40 separate times over stalking and harassing her young son. On one occasion, he tried to lure a young boy out of school by forging a note. Colin ended up becoming homeless and being placed in a homeless shelter in Fife. He continued stalking and harassing young children in the area. Frustratingly, he seemed to slip through the net and police just didn't want to know. Then on the 20th of January 2005, after Karen and Colin had struck up a friendship, things turned incredibly dark. The pair had had an argument and Karen reported Colin to police, not knowing her life was about to be in danger. Colin launched a vicious attack on the 16-year-old. He beat her, strangled her and pulled her hair out. He dragged her down the stairs and then tried to dismember her body. He then stuffed her into a bin and set it on fire. His temporary accommodation was apparently covered in blood and hair. Unaware of the horrors that had taken place that evening, Karen's parents reported her missing. Tragically, the following morning, her charred remains were found. Police apprehended and charged Colin with her murder. He smirked through his court case and was given a life with a minimum of 17 years. These are scary things you should never ask Alexa. So we all know how you can ask Alexa or Siri the strangest questions and get the strangest answers. Well, this is exactly what this girl did when asking her Alexa what the Antichrist is. And this is what Alexa said. It's extremely disturbing and wait till the end. The Antichrist. The noun, Antichrist, can have a few meanings. One, a particular personage or power, variously identified or explained, who is conceived of as appearing in the world as the principal antagonist of Christ. Two, an opponent of Christ, a person or power antagonistic to Christ. Three, a disbeliever in Christ. Four, a false Christ. Alexa, is the Antichrist real? This might answer your question. According to Wikipedia, in Christian eschatology, the Antichrist, or Antichrist, is a person prophesied by the Bible to oppose Christ and substitute himself in Christ's place before the second coming. The term is found five times in the New Testament, solely in the first and second epistle of John. The Antichrist is announced as the one who denies the Father and the Son. Alexa, who is the Antichrist? I'd rather not answer that. Alexa, who is the Antichrist? I'd rather not answer that. Alexa, tell me, who is the Antichrist? Sorry, I'm having trouble. Please try it in a little while. Alexa, where is the Antichrist? Wagner Lamounier has lived in Brazil and was born in Belo Horizonte, Minas Gerais, Brazil. Hmm. Okay. In November 2021, this woman rang her mother and told her that she'd saved her two children. She then dialed 911 and told the dispatcher that she wanted to report a murder. It was, in fact, two murders. Tragically, Liana had slit the throats of her two children and then took them into their beds. The children's father, Travis, had previously voiced concerns about Liana's mental health and she'd actually told hospital staff during a mental health episode that she was hurting her children. She later claimed that this was a false report. The children were briefly placed into Travis's care, but after Liana showed that she was receiving weekly treatment and had spent three weeks in a treatment centre, they were returned back to her. Travis was only allowed every Wednesday and every other weekend visits. Following the 911 call, emergency services found the three-year-old and five-year-old children in their beds tucked in. 
They had lacerations to their throats and defensive wounds on their hands. A steak knife was found under one of the beds. Liana pleaded guilty to the murders, saying, quote, I had to save my children before someone else killed them. It was the only way that we all wouldn't burn. Now I'm the only one of us that will. The children's father, Travis, read out a victim impact statement and said, quote, Every second of the day, all I can picture is Liana brutally murdering my kids. I pleaded over and over that my children were in danger. Before her sentencing this week, Liana addressed the court and said, quote, I did not want to hurt my kids for any other reason than I did not want them to get hurt by anyone else. I felt like I had to protect them forever because I felt like we were not safe. I was supposed to die with them. They visit me in my dreams and that's how I know they're okay. Liana was sentenced this week and she received life in prison. So following on from my last video, which is tagged below, I wanted to cover the crimes of Bobby Joe Long in a little bit more detail. Bobby was born in October 1953 in West Virginia. He married his high school sweetheart, Cindy, in the 70s, but he was extremely abusive towards her. They had two children together, but eventually divorced in 1980 after a particularly bad beating in which Bobby smashed Cindy's head into the TV screen, knocking her unconscious. She received a laceration to the top of her head and she had to drive herself to the hospital. But before she left, Bobby told her that if she told anybody what had happened, he'd kill her. Divorced and alone, Bobby started to contact women through classified ads. And this is where his murder spree began. He moved to Tampa Bay in 1983 and his first victim was 20-year-old Anne Wick, who he raped and strangled while she was hitchhiking. Over the next eight months, Bobby abducted, raped, tortured and murdered seven other women over three counties. The bodies were usually found in a state of decomposition long after the murders, after being dumped in wooded areas. They were usually vulnerable young women walking alone, Bobby would persuade them to get into his vehicle, where he'd then torture and murder them. Bobby's next victim was 17-year-old Lisa McVeigh, who featured in my last video. She was held captive by Bobby for 26 hours before eventually being released. Bobby then went on to murder another two women before eventually being caught. Lisa actually helped in the investigation and Bobby was arrested in November 1984. Bobby Joe Long received eight life sentences and two death sentences for his crimes. He was eventually executed by lethal injection on the 23rd of May 2019, with his two surviving victims present. This is the head crack video, one of the most cold and disturbing videos you will ever watch explained. On October 17th, 2022, Israel Trejo traveled to Riverhead, New York to buy an axe off a person who lived in an apartment building. But this is where 22 year old James Patterson was hanging out. Nobody knows how this footage got leaked, but the CCTV camera is in the corner of the room picking up everything. The clip is short and it's only 14 seconds long, but the video is extremely traumatic. As you play the video, you see four people in the open space apartment. You see a female in the kitchen and another man in the same room as James and Israel. James can be seen sitting on the sofa and it looks like he's eating while looking at his phone. You also see a little dog wandering around the room. Israel Trejo is standing up with the axe resting against his shoulder. He is intently looking at James, but nobody notices it or points out that it's strange. Israel then stares at James for about seven seconds as he holds the axe over his shoulder. He looks over his shoulder quickly before bringing the axe down directly on James's skull, and this makes an extremely loud cracking noise similar to the sound of splitting wood. Israel and the other man in the room then run out of the apartment. The axe is still stuck in James's skull as his body stiffens up and contorts. The woman in the kitchen realizes something is wrong as she heard the loud cracking noise. She then leaves the kitchen and sees James with the axe in his skull. She lets out a few curses before letting out the loudest scream you will ever hear in your life. It's so loud, it literally causes the audio to pop. The best way to describe it is a blood-curling scream. 
James was then taken to the hospital with the axe still in his head, according to a police report. He had surgery, but succumbed to his injuries and died three days after the attack. Israel was arrested shortly after this for suspicion of murder, and in August 2023, he was sentenced to life in prison. There was absolutely no motive for this attack, and it was just senseless murder. This case is absolutely sickening and awful, and may James Patterson rest in peace. This is the most haunted theme park in America, Lake Shawnee in West Virginia. This place is haunted by thousands of ghosts. So Lake Shawnee is a massive abandoned amusement park with a very dark and very disturbing past. Long before the amusement park was ever constructed, a tragedy already occurred on the land. You see, in 1775, a settler named Mitchell Clay made his claim right there on that property. Only a few years later though, two of his children were murdered by indigenous peoples. But a third child of Mitchell's named Ezekiel was captured, he was brought to Ohio, and he was burned at the stake. I mean, look at it, it even says right there on the historical plaque, you can't make this up. All three of those kids' bodies are buried over here in the park property. Now, when Lake Shawnee was first established, people just kept dying. There were so many accidents in the park that it began to gather a haunted or cursed reputation. For example, a child was killed right here on this old abandoned swing set while the swing was in operation. Obviously, there was a drowning or two in this lake, and over here in this lake, I heard a story from the owner when I visited that a child was pulled under the water, supposedly by some sort of phantom force. After the child went under the water, the parents searched they couldn't find their child, but eventually, a while later, they felt something brush against their leg under the water, and it was their child's body. But why could this place be so cursed, you ask? Well, right next to the property is a mass grave for indigenous peoples where over 3,000 bodies are suspected to be buried. I'm talking about the parks right here and just over here is where this huge burial plot is. And people think that obviously if they were all buried right there, some of those bodies may have moved in this direction. Over the years, people have experienced all sorts of paranormal activity here, the most terrifying kind of all. People have seen children sliding down the slides, riding the rides. People have seen figures riding the old Ferris wheel, waving at them, shadow figures that disappear. People have heard the sounds of giggling, heard children's voices, adult voices. And people have even seen eerie creatures and other shadow forms in these woods that surround the park. There's even more history that I'm missing out on here, but if you want to watch the full documentary that I shot there where we stayed overnight, just head to my YouTube channel. It was one of the craziest nights of my life. We had the entire amusement park to ourselves, and we caught some crazy paranormal activity on camera while we were there. Let me know below, would you spend the night here alone? Killer accidentally admitted to his crimes by accident when he forgot he was wearing a microphone while taking part in a documentary. This is how a true crime documentary exposed a killer. In 1971, Robert Durst met Kathleen McCormack and they got married. At the time of her disappearance in 1982, Kathleen had nearly graduated college. She was last seen by a witness at a dinner party where she appeared to be upset. She got a call from Robert and left. Robert admitted to having argued with Kathleen that night, but he said he put her on a train to New York and then never saw her again. Her friend called police to report her missing. Interestingly, Kathleen had been treated at a medical center for facial bruises weeks prior to this and told the friend that Robert had done it. Robert had actually been dating someone else for some time prior to this and had been living separately to Kathleen. When her family broke into her cottage to try and find out where she was, they found the place had been trashed and her possessions put in the bin. Kathleen's family always believed that Robert was involved in her disappearance. In 2000, Susan Berman, a friend of Robert's, was found murdered. Now, she'd actually provided Robert with an alibi for Kathleen's disappearance. Now, pay really close attention to this next bit. Days after she was killed, a letter addressed to the Beverly Hills Police Department contained Susan's address and the word cadaver on it. On the envelope, Beverly was misspelled. Robert admitted in 2005 that Susan had called him shortly before her death to say that the police wanted to question her about Kathleen going missing. It's believed that Robert killed Susan to keep her quiet. In 2001, Robert's neighbor's body parts were found floating in Galveston Bay. Robert's elderly neighbor, Morris Black, had been killed and Robert was arrested. He was actually released on bail and fled and was found about a month later in Pennsylvania. He was found with $37,000 cash, two weapons, and interestingly, Morris Black's driving license. In court, Robert claimed he was acting in self-defense. He said he'd accidentally shot Morris and dismembered his body. Due to lack of forensics, he only got five years in jail. This is where things get really crazy. HBO was filming a documentary called The Jinx. During production, Susan's stepson found a letter written by Robert. 
This contained the same spelling error in the word Beverly as the anonymous letter to police. This implicated Robert in the murder. Now, while filming the documentary, Robert needed the toilet. He forgot that he had a microphone still attached to him. He was recorded talking to himself. He said, there it is, you're caught. You're right, of course, but you can't imagine. Arrest him. And then he said, what a disaster. He was right, I was wrong. And finally he said, I'm having difficulty with the question. What the hell did I do? Killed them all, of course. Imagine getting married only to be decapitated by your husband three months later. 21-year-old couple Jared and Angie got married in October 2022. Around 4pm on the 11th of January, police were called to their home in Texas. Police made a grim discovery in the pair's bathroom after finding, quote, what appeared to be the head of the victim to be in the shower, end quote. Angie's body was discovered on the floor near the bed in a pool of blood with multiple stab wounds to her back. It was actually Jared's poor parents that initially made this discovery after entering the home. They then obviously alerted police to what they found. Jared was arrested and has confessed to killing his wife with a kitchen knife. Jared was actually captured on CCTV, casually stealing a bottle of beer from Angie's workplace just minutes after it's believed that he killed her. Angie's friends have reported to police that the couple's relationship was toxic and Jared was very controlling. Jared's bond is currently set at $500,000. This schoolboy stabbed his teacher to death in front of a classroom full of students. 61-year-old Anne Maguire was a Spanish teacher teaching in Leeds. She'd actually worked at the school for 40 years and she was only five months off retirement. However, in April 2014, something absolutely horrific happened. One of her students was 15-year-old Will Cornick. He'd always been described as a smart student who never really caused any trouble. Classmates regarded him as a polite student, but after he got diagnosed with diabetes, his personality seemed to change. In 2013, he tried to join the army, but because of his diagnosis, he was rejected. Being in the army had been his dream, so this was really upsetting for him. After failing to complete his Spanish homework, he was given detention by Anne. He also expressed a wish to her that he wanted to drop Spanish, but she wouldn't let him, which only angered him more. He began to develop a deep-rooted grudge against Anne. Shockingly, he reportedly messaged his friends on Facebook asking if one of them would kill her for him for £10. During one school day, halfway through his Spanish class, Will decided to get up and attack Anne with a knife. The classmates watched on in horror as he chased her out of the classroom. When there, another teacher heard her screams and tried to shield Anne from any more blows from him. Will then allegedly returned to his class and told his classmates how it was a shame that he hadn't killed her. However, Anne did actually pass away from her injuries. Will later admitted that he did plan also to kill two other teachers. One of them was actually pregnant at the time. He's been sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years. This is one of the most horrific cases I've heard recently, so please be warned before watching. 29-year-old Taylor Parker has just been sentenced to death for a crime so horrendous that I can't believe a human is capable of this. Regan Simmons Hancock and Taylor had met online. Their online friendship soon blossomed into a real-life connection. It was 2022 and Regan was married with a young daughter. She was also eight months pregnant at this time. Taylor was also pregnant, or so it would seem to the outside world. She was posting pregnancy pictures on social media and even hosted a gender reveal party. Little did her loved ones know that she was actually staging the entire thing. Regan and Taylor were really good friends around this time and they were bonding over their pregnancies. Regan even shared a Facebook status thanking Taylor for bringing her around a gift and Starbucks. This was the day before she would be murdered by Taylor. On Taylor's supposed due date, she made her way round to Regan's house in Texas. Shortly after, Regan's mum made a horrifying discovery. Her daughter was face down on the floor, deceased with blood everywhere. Her mum rang the emergency services and they raced to the scene. It became apparent that her baby had been, and again, a massive, massive trigger warning here, ripped out of her stomach and Regan had been stabbed over a hundred times. 
Meanwhile, Taylor was pulled over for speeding and driving erratically. She'd actually put the baby in her lap with the umbilical cord coming out of her trousers to make it seem like she'd just given birth. When the pair were taken to hospital, the horrors of what actually happened became apparent. The newborn baby tragically passed away and Taylor was arrested. She was sentenced to death, but her defense lawyer said that her loved ones should have done more to protect her earlier on when she was pretending to be pregnant.